guys. Okay, let's do this. So, uh, you know, at can oftentimes on panels, it's a bunch of talking heads saying the same thing. So we're going to try to do it a little different, get into it a little more. You know, we had some discussions the other day, had some nice arguments, so we're going to do that. You know, one thing that it, I think is, uh, I'm going to be honest, I'm not a fan of the Brooklyn Nets. I'm a Knicks fan, but I am a Tragic. fan. <laughs> I am a fan of innovation and creativity. And I, I think you're gonna hear about some of that here. You know, About a year ago, all the talk was Web3. And you saw a lot of fake experts talking about Web3. Web and then things change, and you don't hear about those experts anymore. That, you know, but sometimes you have people that actually understand Web3 or technology and see through things and persevere and experiment and innovate. So I'm excited to talk to you guys because I think that's uh, what we're gonna get into here. So. You know, at a high level, let's just talk about ownership because, you know, your business revolves around that. So, you know, what is ownership to you? What is ownership of yourself as a brand? Like, what does that mean? Me first. What's up, everybody? How y'all doing? First, first and foremost, hope you're having a good day. I know it's kind of early. Um, ownership, um, I think it's the authority and autonomy piece, right? I think, uh, especially as an athlete, when we're thinking about our brand or our likeness, um, shoot, NIL for the, for the kids nowadays, right? It's all about just kind of the, the authority, autonomy, and being able to monetize yourself uh, more effectively, hopefully without too much of a middleman. Obviously, in a lot, some ways, they're, they're effective and, and necessary. In some ways, they take an absorbent uh, you know, fee. Um, but, but I think that's the main like, high-level premise of how like, kind of an athlete or any uh, entertainer, creator, et cetera, that has kind of a brand value, something that, you know, uh, more normal people, I guess, want to consume, uh, would think about it. Yeah, I would think one thing when you relate it as pertains to Web3 and principally, you know, the idea of peer-to-peer -peer networks and, you know, the power that we can unlock, you know, moving away from the middleman, back to what you were saying, I think it turns into the idea, you know, ownership is a, a mechanism that actually allows you to own things and, 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 and actually monetize like who you are. And so I think when you think about the traditional social media model that we have today, it's a lot of times you don't really own anything that's associated with your likeness. You really use your likeness as a means to you know, help some other you know, agenda potentially um, you know, by partnering with somebody else and stuff like that. But what we really were passionate about is finding another use case for decentralized technologies and allowing you know, person to person interactions to actually facilitate means and value outside of just sending money. Like when you think about blockchain, the first thing you think about principally is unlocking the value in the financial system by getting rid of a middle party. Um, but by allowing that model to touch the creator economy, you're actually you know, allowing people to you know, own their own image and also you know, be able to connect with their fans. And so that's kind of what our business endeavors have been centered around. So I want to get into Calixy in a second. Before, but one question before I do that. You know, ownership obviously is tied to equity, and there's always there's been a lot of discussion about equity and being more equitable. But most of the time, people talk about equity as the upside. The upside is pretty obvious. You know, it, it means something. But equity also has a downside that is not talked about as much. So I'm just curious what you see as the downside of equity. You know, as as an owner, for example, like if you're a company and you're a public company, things can go bad. You lose money. You can lose money. Yeah. So what, as, as it, how do you think about, a create, from a creator economy standpoint, and creators focus on ownership and equity, what are the downsides of that? I mean, I would say the first downside that, that we experience would be the ones you just kind of named. Um, if there's any skin in the game, you can always obviously lose money. I think it's the... Uh, Morality piece is the secondary one where you get into the whole like indentured servitude type of um, uh, dialogue and discourse um, surrounding kind of ownership as it pertains to people. So I think those are kind of the two big lines. Um, people are very familiar with losing money as it, as it pertains to something that's uh, not necessarily as tangible, I guess, um, in terms of like a company or something like that, right? You can't. You can, you can drink a Pepsi, but you can't like reach out and touch Pepsi, the company, right? So if it loses money, it's not like you're like, hey, Spencer, you lost me money. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not the same type of feeling of, uh, or tangible nature. 
Um, and then obviously, like I said, the, the discourse that'll happen around uh, servitude. I think that's a great point, but also, you know, on top of that, to piggyback off of it, when you think about, you know, what you're essentially doing, a lot of it is almost pooling the likeness and images of a, a lot of people that might work with a brand and, you know, allowing yourself to extract value from that. That's why brands have many different brand ambassadors, et cetera. You know, you associate the equity upside, downside, or, you know, risk analysis with the idea of, you know, whether the company will lose money and you don't care about that same tang tangibility factor that you have with a physical product. Uh, I mean, sorry, that you have with like an individual person because you're able to associate with a big conglomerate or like a big brand. But the downside of that is we need to like get into this next era of thinking where everybody themselves owns their own IP, owns their own things because, you know, in a way, not being able to do that is what makes it harder for, you know, people, you know, associate. of all different types to actually monetize like who they are, right? And it's really hard because you get into this market where, you know, it's similar to like the NIL things where like a lot of it, it's been great for the, you know, top percentage of creators or top percentage of athletes, et cetera, but there's a you know, the 99% of people that need that ownership model to actually, you know, monetize effectively and efficiently. Um, whereas, like, the, if you're, you know, if you're Drake, if you're anyone massive, like, you don't really need to be efficient because you're just that influential. Yeah. And so I think it's like when you, you know, think about what's at stake, it's that equity model that allows that 99% that people don't necessarily think about. Um, but are heavily influential. These are your TikTokers. These are other people outside even, you know, these are your, you know, TikTokers, your YouTubers, all different types of creators. But then, you know, even relating it back to sports, it's, um, you know, all different tiers of, of creators. And that's why that ownership model is so important for unlocking value for people that may not be that, that you, And you touched on something from a psychology perspective, like the psychology of ownership and equity. I think we will reach a stage where everything's a chip on the table. And as that happens, we'll disassociate it with owning the person and we'll just understand that, you know, this piece of whatever it is has a certain uh, a metric of value and we watch it go up and down. But I think it's a, as we graduate to that type of mentality, because obviously everything comes in stages and phases as you, as you talked about, there's gonna be kind of that, that inflection point of, of morality. Okay, so let's pivot now to, I think there's a web three. People have an assumption in their head of what Web3 is uh, based on, you know, horrible media coverage of it over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think you guys are doing something really interesting. And as a hater of most uh, experiences, uh, your product is pretty incredible. So why don't you talk a little about, uh, you know, what you've been up to, what Galaxy is, why is it different than what everybody thinks Web3 is, um, and like the real use case behind it. And I think there's a, a video that Cue the video, maybe. We do the video now or no? Yeah, you go and then. Us, us first? Yeah, play in the background, I think, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll do a little Web3 conversation because I don't talk about Calyx anymore. I, I leave it to the, the CEO and the, the big dog sitting to my right. Um, you know, when we think about decentralization and we think about uh, blockchain technology, it's kind of that verified scarcity. Um, and then what I talked about in terms of being able to fractionalize things. Um, and everything being a chip on the table. I think that's one of the main uh, benefits of blockchain. He talked about it uh, hitting the financial industry first, um, as most people think about it, um, because of Bitcoin, they think of money, things like that. But it's gonna hit every, uh, every demographic, every sector. We talk about owning intellectual property. Um, obviously, we saw a little bit to a degree with NFTs, but that was kind of a bad example because we were just dealing with JPEGs, you get off the internet. Um, but it's, it's really that, that next step, that, that, that further, uh, uh, proof of scarcity, um, validating transactions, uh, things of that nature. And then obviously we had the AI conversation yesterday as well. Yeah, I would say for us, you know, thinking about what Galaxy's main vision and value proposition is, is demystifying and actually, you know, obstructing what is complex about blockchain and selling the benefits to a new use case, which is the creator economy. So when you think about blockchain, you think about Web3, you just think about decentralizing the banking system you are being told that you no longer need to go to, you know, the, the, the big banks, you know, to necessarily facilitate the exchanging of value between parties. Um, but what we saw is that there's actually an even bigger problem, which is like the idea of connecting value from like, you know, sports to fans or athletes to fans. That's how our journey started, um, you know, three years ago. I mean, four years ago at this point, um, you know, I got a crazy call, five, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Five years ago, I got a crazy call. Uh, I was an investment banker working in structured products out of New York, and 
uh, my brother was telling me that Spencer wanted to do some crazy thing with his contract that made no sense. And uh, <laughs> you guys might have actually seen it, but Spencer was the first NBA player to tokenize his contract uh, on the blockchain, unlocking that value out of his contract uh, earlier than he otherwise would have. Um, but, you know, that was essentially our journey. And he told me that he wanted to do that for the entire sports league. And I was like, you know, that's a... Uh, crazy because we get that all the time at the big banks but we saw that was you know our journey but we wanted to build you know a product that allowed um you know people to 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 be able to monetize themselves and so that's when we shifted to you know what you saw behind me which was a demo of the product that we've built which is like a creator economy platform kind of a new social media platform that allows a content creator to sell different digital experiences to their fans through the use of the blockchain um so unlocking that instant payment when you think about you know peer-to-peer -peer networks, um, the benefit of being able to get on a call with Spencer Dinwiddie or LeBron James or whoever it is, um, essentially we're a marketplace for that type of uh, activity to happen. Um, and it's also all verifiable on chain and in a world where AI and all these different technologies are increasing content creation, um, you know, things like the blockchain are gonna be really helpful so that you know that you have provenance from where something was, you know, the source or where it came from. Um, and that's going to be increasingly important. So we wanted to build something that made it easy to use. So I'm just going to ask the standard Web3 question. You kind of touched on it a little, but, but why blockchain? Can you really not do that technology in other ways? And are you solving for blockchain, or are you using technology like blockchain to solve another problem that exists? Me first? Are you yeah, first? go first. I have another answer, too, though. Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll take a little bit from uh, what we talked about yesterday, right, um, and, and leave more Galaxy-specific things uh, to him again. Um, as content creation evolves, as AI evolves, uh, as you start to blur the lines between who's who and then also where it came from, like I said, again, scarcity creates value. I mean, human beings in general have, have always loved things uh, that were scarce. Um, and then also being able to verify a uh, source, right? So, so blockchain helps us do that. I think you saw the demo uh, behind us. Uh, I, I can't see, but you you saw that we tried to make it look like a web two, very very user friendly. So this wasn't something where we tried to uh, you know take too much blockchain, put it in your face, and and make it something where we were trying to be a, a solution in search of a problem. But we really wanted to uh, have something that was user friendly, have something that was familiar to the people, um, really give experiential uh, rewards in a sense, um, remove as much of the middleman as we possibly could, but also you know verify and, and, and have that scarcity for you as well. Yeah, I would say from you know the Galaxy Pacific side, um, you know one thing that we always get obviously is the white blockchain question, and I think the benefits of blockchain are very quite clear, right? But I think the problem is convincing people to kind of care about those benefits. Um, and so when you think about it, like, uh, you know, my parents are from West Africa. Um, and when you think about different parts of the world, like certain parts are, you know, super developed and some parts are not. And so the benefits of, you know, being able to trust that your transaction and your money is going to go from where you have it to where you intend um, is super valuable. But like, you know, some, you know, you always have this quote, privilege is invisible. To privilege those is, have is invisible to those <laughs> who have it, baby. Yeah, exactly. And so when you think about it, other parts of the world may not function like that. And when you think about content creators, when you think about athletes, you think about all different types of athletes, not just the, everybody wants to talk about how do we, you know, get the A-listers or the tier one guys, you know, better contact with their fans. But these, these technologies increasing the ability for a person to be able to get into contact with the people that support them um, or connect with their fans and sell those experience. Um, you know, you can truly extract the value out of a peer-to-peer -peer network. What's more is when you create a Web3 ecosystem and you, you know, have a wallet out of the box, you're essentially, you know, a bank out of the box too. And so there's a lot more power um, and a lot more, um, you know, a lot more liquidity within like the network and like assets and they become a lot more powerful with things like blockchain because you can actually get more use out of them because you can easily move them from one place to another. So in some way, would you say, you know, with all the hype and talk about AI, in some way is Galaxy and blockchain kind of a solution to deep fakes and an understanding of what is real and what is not real? Um, in a way, for sure. Um, to, to the deep fake problem specifically, I would say yes, right? Like we, we can verify things and, and, and really draw that line of distinction. Um, but in terms of working in concert or, or working uh, in conflict rather th uh, with AI, I'd say we, we work more uh, together with AI because uh, again, like, like I said yesterday, I, I view 
most AI systems in terms of if they're going to work effectively, they're going to be kind of running the 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 verify and the checks in the background. I don't mean the, the checks in terms of like uh, transaction finality, but I think um, in terms of content creation, in terms of uh, idea proofing, like you're going to be able to tell an AI, AI system like, hey, I want to try this. Do I have a market for it? And it's going to be able to run the analytics for it without you really having to either A, hire a company to do it, or B, test it out yourself. It's going to be able to kind of run the models uh, and work with other systems to really be able to see if what you're doing uh, has validity. And then you're going to be able to kind of be more efficient in how you create content and, and have that uh, assistant there. Yeah, I would say the role Galaxy plays in it is that it's an interface layer to make this technology actually usable and useful to people who don't really care about the underlying technology. Like I always used to say that like if driving an electric car was any bit more complicated than driving a regular car, a lot of people would be um, you know, sticking with gas cars. Um, and so the idea is really, you know, technology has to be not just usable, but it needs to be useful. And so what we've done is, you know, obstructed all of the complexities that require, you know, that, uh, with, um, you know, the con con complexities that come with uh, blockchain traditionally. Um, you know, even, for example, in our user journey, we've bifurcated the idea of, you know, account creation, like creating your own account. Um, and you know the wallet creation that may or may not be p necessary for you depending on who you might be. Um, and so what we've done is really built an interface that makes actually sending you know, and using these technologies um, super easy. So let me ask this question. You know, one of the problems that, you know, that I think, I personally think that Web3 had was it became so focused on the transaction versus you know, the creator economy or as an entertainer, there, that's entertainment. Like people want to like, you know, feel emotion and other things. So how do you uh, sort of play that balance where you need the economic, I mean, we're talking about ownership, equity, and there are economics to this, but really with the focus of like, hey, people don't want to be just like waking up and like trading assets every single day. Well, like anything, right? You gotta, you gotta make it sexy, you gotta make it seamless, you gotta make it familiar, right? And so I think if you look at the user interface, there, there's, very big shades of web two, right? And, and he even talked about this right now, just even down to the wallet creation and things of that nature. Like uh, web three can seem overwhelming just because it's so foreign, right? And it's a little bit complicated and you have all this risk of complete and total loss if you don't know what you're doing. So, you know, I think um, Galaxy's mission in part was to remove that, that friction for the, for the regular, you know what I'm saying, everyday user. And I think um, in a lot of ways we did that. Yeah, I would also say that um, when you think about the, the, the way in which we intend to use the technologies, we want to sell the benefits of the technology. And I know I keep repeating myself, but it's the problem is in our space and a lot of emerging technologies, people are trying to build awesome technology that does awesome things that they don't quite know what for and then try and shove it in the face of people. Whereas like our you know, our journey has been quite a long one. We started it as a capital markets, you know, aspirational company that is a, you know, securitizer of NBA contracts, music royalties. Now we're more of like a creator economy type platform, like a Cameo or a Patreon, whatever type of platform like that. And so for us, um, you know, we've been able to take that technology and find a way to solve it, which is helping creators actually, or, you know, athletes um, extract that value from that fan and, you know, be able to do that at a point in order and get paid instantly and be verified and not have any sort of dependencies that live outside their own regime, um, which makes it super easy for them and their team to be able to better, um, you know, own their brand um, and image. And then also, too, when you have a model like where you're actually creating more equitable earning models and, uh, means to generating revenue for you know athletes and creators. Um, essentially, you're 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 allowing them to then go out and align with brands in a more uh, you know a more deep and impactful way for things that they're actually passionate about. Versus in this world where everyone's scrambling to try and you know work with X Y Z person because they also have an audience. You have a following. This person has a following. This person has a following, and everyone's fighting for those same deals. If you're better able to you know extract, you can actually partner with the brands and market the things that you know you you actually care about. But then also your own self, you'll be able to market yourself better and actually extract value, um, make it a lot easier for that 99 percent. Yeah, and then obviously I'm obviously biased towards Galaxy and our company and everything we're doing. But if you look at kind of our own education and growth process as we, you know, have tried different things and, and been and work with, you know, the masses, et cetera. Um, to his point, we started out looking at securitizing a contract, 
But the premise in, in general was about uh, liquidity, right? That, that blockchain can kind of give you, and, and again, that, that scarcity and validity. So, you know, it, it started off with the, with the contract, and then as we approached the creator economy, it kind of shows like his, his background coming from a region that, you know, banking uh, uh, may not be as accessible to most. You still have to unlock all that value, right? And you also have to make it something that's uh, massively uh, or has massive appeal. You know, there's only 500 NBA players, so even if we securitize every contract, we'd be a profitable business, but there is a certain cap. And once you attack the creator economy and it, you make everybody a creator, right? Everybody in this, in these bleachers, right, I guess, or seats or whatever, um, <laughs> can be a creator, you know what I mean? Like all seven and a half, eight billion of us now with, with a certain tool in our hand can monetize ourselves. And so it's just a much bigger reach. Um, and, it, and again, not, not slapping blockchain on it, trying to, you know, be a solution in search of a problem, but really creating a, 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 a solution for the creator economy and having that base layer that just really validates transactions, et cetera. So, you know, on that, that point, you know, you're a creator, you're a brand. We talked a little about this yesterday. You know, Spring Hill says you are not a brand. Uh, you're a human, but you're a company trying to monetize everything about yourself, but keeping things private. So are you a brand? Are you a human? Are you, what are you? Uh, here, here's the thing, man. I think, um, how do I put this? Uh, I'm, cause I want to be nice because I respect all the guys at Spring Hill. I, I think sometimes in the social media age, we use different adjectives and put different spins on things to try to make ourselves more unique. And I, and I know that's part of monetization because you have to kind of be unique to reach a different audience. But if I'm a company selling something, then inherently I have a brand. Like it, so I can say I'm not a brand because it sounds possibly a little more dehumanizing, but if you really understand the intention of what I'm saying, then I'm still a brand. You know what I mean? Like, and, and it may make me feel better to call myself a company, and I am, right? But Pepsi's a company. They're fucking brand too. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I feel like they're kind of playing with words to feel a little bit better. But yes, we are humans. Yes, we deserve a certain level of privacy. But like I told you up there, when you step into certain arenas, you sign up for something. Like, I couldn't get on this stage today and be like, oh, but if I say something stupid, I, they can't get up and leave. They have to be nice to me, blah, blah. It don't work like that. When I step into the NBA, I'm immediately playing in front of millions of people on a three night per week basis. You have to carry yourself a certain way. That's what you are stepping into. And I know that, you know what I'm saying, my views are a little bit more callous than some. And I know that, you know, we're in kind of the day and age of participation awards, but that's not the way that I live my life. And it's more so, you know, you can cause a company, you can cause a brand. Effectively, it's the same thing. You know, we are monetizing ourselves. We all have a goal to feed our family. And we are in the public eye and do have some level of responsibility to the public because we are public figures. Now, does it mean that, your kid has to follow every single thing I do, and, and I can't be forgiven for any mistakes I made or should completely be forgiven? No, it's somewhere in the middle, but that's everything in life. There, there's, there's very rarely a, a supreme black or white, unless we're talking about mathematics. There's always some level of gray, and we do have a duty to the public, as well as some level of, of privacy is owed as well. I mean, do you get nervous, uh, you know, when Bud Light makes a strategic error, someone could get fired, and maybe or maybe not, they'll recover. If you make a strategic error, what are you doing? Who are you firing? If I make a strategic error? I mean, You know what I'm, I'm not, saying? Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if You, you if are I the brand. Pepsi yeah. is not a person. Well, remember. Or Bud Light, sorry. The same way we I'll just talked about equity, right? Like, So when you invest in Pepsi, Bud Light, et cetera, you're sharing in only some part of the upside. But you started companies before. You have a far more lion's share of the upside. As, you know what I'm saying, you have more upside and equity, et cetera, you have more responsibility, more authority, et cetera. So if you have 100% of this equity model, right, then you have to take your lumps on the chin as well. And it's not necessarily about firing, but you understand that, okay, I, I screw up this Bud Light deal. I may not get another deal for a year or two, and that may have cost me three, four, five million dollars. Does it mean that I'm going to go broke and I'll, I'll never be okay? No. Good thing I have, you know, 20 five years worth of work in basketball, et cetera, that keeps me in the NBA and, and doing my job at a very high level. But I definitely missed out on that opportunity, you know? So that, that's the way I look at it. And that's why I said, I think some, some of my views are more callous, but you know, it's, it's part of the game. We, everybody has to sacrifice. Even a person not doing nothing, if they're a bum, they're sacrificing the good life they could have had to have the easy road that they do. So everybody sitting in this seat has some level of sacrifice to make. 
and, and we'll continue to have it. So with that, you know, is AI the gold mine or landmine for you? And, how, and even the follow-up to that as a, as a person, maybe from a Galaxy perspective, like how you're thinking about it to help, you know, the creator economy and creators. So, but let's, as an individual first, or a brand. <laughs> um, as an individual and as a brand, I think, um, I say gold mine, to be honest. I mean, I just think that the, being able to kind of like have somebody basically proofread your assignments at a, at a super high effectiveness level, I think is going to make content creation easier. And then um, we talked about it a little bit, DK was up there and he said, you know, he felt that the Aaron Rodgers of the world, LeBron James of the world would get a lot more deals because they could be in more places at, at once. And I said, yeah, I do think that is one thing that'll happen. I think that the other thing that'll happen is it'll make the unique experiences with a DK or myself, the tier two or lower guys or whatever, um, because I was just in China and, you know, over there, they align my story. So I'm one of the bigger athletes in China just from the simple fact that they align with the journey that I've had in terms of injuries, recovery, et cetera, has nothing to do with maybe the excellence factor of a LeBron or a Steph Curry, right? And so now my in-person experience in China may be worth $10 million, whereas LeBron's AI avatar or whatever may only get him couple hundred thousand and he'll still get 50 deals to my five but my five may be 10 million each you know and so there will be some level of of equity between the model just because like everybody's going to continue to find their niche everybody has to that's the way the world works you know what i'm saying if you're a spot up shooter you're a spot up shooter if you're a quarterback that runs you run if not you're a pocket passer or maybe you're a dual threat i don't know right but you gotta you gotta be who you are in this world right and and sacrifice is, is requisite to whoever you are i think it's a I think I'm gonna throw a wrench into it. I think it is a gold mine, but I think in a world where everyone seeks convenience, um, the one thing I would want AI to do is obviously help with the mundane to allow and spur more creativity and allow people to continue to create. Um, but I think the hard part is like in this society, in the world that we live in today, people seek out convenience so much so that they might actually destroy the creativity they have. And so I wonder what that impact might actually be in terms of you know, all of the goods that we you know, consume for the public good um, if we have all these tools at our disposal. From a Galaxy perspective, you know, I think our, our mission and goal is to help content creators, athletes, musicians, TikTokers, influencers, but you know, obviously it started off with athletes, um, you know, better connect with their fans and extract the value they have from their fans. Um, but, you know, we also wanted to, on the other side of it, give them the tools to better be able to own their, 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 their public image business. Um, and so being able to do things like, you know, sell those digital experiences and monetize that image, but then also having the content creation tools. Um, so partnering with AI companies and creating AI tools in our suite of products that we have, because um, we view ourselves as a true tech company. We're not a social media company. We're not... Um, you know, any of these things, we build products for people that actually help them do things. Um, and so I would say, you know, for us, from a, from a philosophical standpoint, I think it's great. It's going to accelerate all the, you know, the, the, all the production. It's going to accelerate con uh, all the different types of, um, you know, the, the, the mundane tasks that we do. It's going to free us up to do more. I just hope that with the more time we have, um, that people start, don't lose that idea of, like, what makes all of us unique. Because, you know, eventually, where is the where is the upside going to come from if you know, uh, you know, everyone's doing the exact same thing? Well, yeah, it makes me think. You know, Galaxy in some way. You know, you talked about scarcity, and you know, as a person that is living, and my access to you in a real world is scarce. I can only be someone could only be where you are, yeah. but AI can represent you and sort of extend that so more people can access maybe who you are, you know, your, your identity in other meaningful ways. How do you balance that when you're thinking about the idea of scarcity and the value of, you know, that, that feeling? I think scarcity is still going to be a thing. Like, fundamentally, I just do. I think um, you may be able to access my response. You may be able to access my uh, moves on the court or thought process on how I'd approach a play or something of that nature. And so, yes, the, those aspects, the predictable aspects of Spencer will be less scarce. But to reach out and shake my hand and say, like, okay, I sat down with the man still is just as scarce. You know what I mean? I but think is, is it almost better for the opposite? Like, for example, 20 years from now, out of the league, 
you know, you got to keep your relevance going. Is that representative, that AI version that may be better than you of the real you? Is it not better for you as the brand of the business to extend that out? I think it's better to extend it out for sure. I think my AI will be better than me. It's just kind of in, inherently how evolution Hopefully works. my AI of you is not better than your AI of she. you. <laughs> Don't play now. Come on now. <laughs> One of the best to do it. No. Uh, no, but in general, I, I think my AI will be better than me. I think your AI will be better than you. I think our kids are going to be better than us. I mean, I think evolution kind of tracks uh, uh, the same way, whether it be in real life or it be, you know, virtually, right? I just think... Um, in that situation, sorry, I'm checking the timer too. I know we we out of time, but um, get off or finish the finish. Wrap, wrap it up. All right. I, and uh, uh, last thing I'll say, he was a phenomenal football player in his own right. He always introduced himself as an investment banker, but he was a phenomenal football player, and his AI football playing version of himself will be better than himself. I just wanted to end on a joke. Sorry. I mean, I think one thing I would just say, too, is like, you know, back to it, is like being able to be one place at one time. It's like not more is not always better, right? Like certain things, you know, this is an unbelievable event. Thank you, Stagwell, for having us. Appreciate it. You guys did a great job. Appreciate you for moderating. Um, I think one thing you think about it is, uh, you know, just, you know, being able to be at one place in the wrong time, that would be great as a content creation tool so that I can actually monetize that AI, you know, version of myself. Um, and, you know, also you could use that as a tool to, to be the best version of yourself. What does your fan base actually, you know, gravitate to the most in terms of who you are and, you know, leaning into that perspective. And so it's going to be exciting to, to see how we could use all those tools. Awesome. Well, I'll wrap it up. I'll say, again, I'm a hater of most things, but Galaxy is a pretty unique tool. So, you know, you guys should check it out. And I thank you guys for doing this. And uh, I appreciate it. As is on Discourse. Come on, on now. Discourse. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.